Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And actually, Rich McFadden from the Radio American Network, along with Jim Garrity from National Review Online, here for your Tuesday martinis. And uh, welcome to Tuesday, Jim. How's everything rolling so far? Uh, it's, it's good, bad, and crazy, which is our tradition right around here. <laughs> well, I like it. Well, let's jump right into it then with the good, uh, Nikki Haley wasting no time getting started. She's, uh, the, the chair is barely warm and she's already getting applause from some crowds. Yeah. Uh, this is over at the, uh, APAC conference and, and look, you know, we, we should expect, uh, the U S ambassador to the UN get applauded, but look, it's not often you see somebody jump into the job and have a pretty quick impact. Um, this around the middle of last month. Uh, there's a Palestinian by the name of Rima Kalaf who uh, was part of the head of a Beirut-based United Nations agency um, who drew, wrote a report accusing Israel of apartheid. It basically represented the standard Israel bashing that a lot of folks have come to expect from the United Nations. The difference between life under President Trump and life right. under President Obama is that in this case, U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley um, basically demanded that the U.S. the U.N. withdraw from the report. It is false and defamatory. Um, it is appropriate for the person to resign, and the person resigned. And it uh, this is so when wow. she goes to the APAC, this isn't just the usual promise of oh we're going to stand up for our allies. This is a you know we already have demonstrated that we we have we've gotten results, and that the you know, business as usual at the U.N. brings such a vociferous objection from the United Nations from the United States that the uh, person in question has to resign for issuing a false report. So it's just some great lines from there. You know, the United States tell them, tells them what we're not going to put up with, Haley said. We start to change the culture of what we should be talking about, and then we actually act on what we say. Uh, the line I love here is, I wear heels. It's not for a fashion statement. It's because if I see something wrong, we're going to kick them every single time. That is awesome. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and just kind of an observation that, okay, uh, the, you know, if, if you look at the, uh, my colleague Jay Nordler likes to point out that we in the United States kind of shrug at the United Nations. We tend to ignore it. We don't think it's a big deal. We think it's kind of this, you know, uh, silly, useless, uh, diplomatic debating club up in New York city, but the rest of the world seems to take it very seriously. And so I think it, it, one of the ways that the UN, what, you know, you could argue the, the world has gone wrong in a lot of ways, but a big one is that the United Nations, which is allegedly mm -hmm. supposed to be this force for good and stability and order and to, to help resolve conflicts has decided that just bashing Israel is much more fun than actually doing anything about any of the world's real problems. And it looks like under Nikki Haley, uh, business as usual has been severely interrupted. Well, and the other good thing about it is that it, it kind of shows a step in the direction of America first, uh, which, you know, when it comes to our international relationships, uh, over the past eight years has just been taking a back seat. So the fact that we set the agenda and we are pushing the agenda again, it makes, God, it's a great thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, I'm, I'm going to argue that if, if, if you find the American nationalism to be a problem, if you, if you feel like you're afraid we're going to turn away from the rest of the world, then one of the things you have to do is you have to have international institutions like the United Nations not be such a joke, right? They have to be Absolutely. seen as something that can genuinely be constructive as opposed to uh, this irrelevant debating society that sits around and, and blames Israel while Syria falls apart and creates a refugee crisis that, you know, destabilizes Europe. Um, Nikki, now, can Nikki Haley single-handedly undo that? I don't know. It's a lot of work to be done, uh, but it's just wonderful to see somebody jumping into the job and having an impact very early on. Well, congratulations to her for actually having the, the brass to be able to, to get something done, which doesn't seem like anybody else is having any luck. On to our bad martini for the day. And this one, I, you know, I have a little trouble with this. Song. I'm usually a fan of government creating uh, a stadium around a sports team and building up a city around it. I'm from Washington, D.C. I've seen what the Wizards have done in Chinatown. I've seen what the Nats have done down on the, uh, the waterfront. And it's, I've seen what Baltimore did uh, with the Inner Harbor. But the Raiders are going to move to Las Vegas, and I'm not sure that that's a city that really needs to pony up for the infrastructure. Do you? No. And look, I, I have hated taxpayer financing of stadiums in any way, shape, or form. 
Uh, the one thing I will give credit when we talk about what we used to call it MCI, is it still Verizon Center downtown? Is that what they're calling it's it? It's still Verizon Center, yeah. The phone companies keep changing. Yeah, so yeah. You know, what we used to call the MCI Center, the home of the Wizards and the Capitals and George Hoyas and other teams down in, in uh, downtown D.C., the only thing the city had to donate was the land. Uh, the entire edifice, the entire building itself was built by Abe Poland, the owner of the teams, which was a, by the standards of today, a pretty generous deal to the city. Um, in the case of Oakland versus Las Vegas, Las Vegas was willing to raise $750 million in hotel taxes. So in their minds, I'm sure some folks are saying, well, look, we're not really charging people in Nevada. We're charging hotel guests. But of course, if you run a hotel, now your hotel rooms are more expensive because the state has just hiked up the... Uh, the tax that your guests pay. Yeah. I don't like tax hikes, period. But I really don't like the idea of tax hikes to build football stadiums. Um, I don't like the idea of build for any stadiums. Um, but even football stadiums, you know, yeah, you can use them for outdoor concerts sometimes. Uh, but for an NFL team, let's face it, you get two preseason home games, eight regular season home games, and then if you're really lucky, you get two playoff games, right? So there's you know a couple of Sundays. Yeah. Maybe you find a college team to play on Saturdays. Uh, but there are a lot of days that stadium is just going to sit there unused. And I, I've never liked the idea of sports stadiums being the centerpiece of economic development projects. Um, whatever you think of Oakland Raider fans, and let's face it, they're yeah. scary people, right? They're, they, oh, they, they are scary. There, there was a good Onion report that said Raider Nation represent, is, is, ranks dead last in many UN measurements of uh, national development. <laughs> um, it's basically a biker rally, S&M garb, and the Imperial March. It, it's all it's a freak show. But you know what? Not even Raider fans deserve to be treated like this. And the particularly galling aspect uh, from the, uh, the Raiders owner, Davis, it's not Al Davis, it's his son, Mark Davis, uh, is that they're not leaving until 2019, maybe right. 2020, depending on how, how quickly they can build the stadium out of Las Vegas. So there's still the Oakland Raiders this year and next year. So it's based, I like the analogy from Mike Greenberg on ESPN uh, this morning where he said, look, this is like your spouse saying, I'm getting a, we're divorcing. I'm leaving you two to three years from now. But in the meantime, I expect you to still love me and treat me like your spouse. Right. Uh, do you think the Raiders fans are going to be? <laughs> and by the way, do you have a couch I can sleep option? on for the next two years? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so I just, you know, we're familiar with this story before, but it stinks every time it happens. It is abuse of a fan base. It is pitting one city against another, and it's using tax dollars for a wow. sport that should be, you know, for, for millionaires and billionaires to, to play in a, in a building. And, and the real not... dilemma is California should never get an NFL franchise again. Uh, they cannot make up their mind. Uh, a franchise doesn't last there anywhere there for uh, more than a decade. Oakland was the longest one. Uh, the fact that they're moving San Diego and the rant, it's just, it's craziness. Those people can't. The 49ers they, have been there for a while, but yeah, yeah but the, other than that's that, true. there's yeah, been yeah, a ridiculous yeah. amount of uh, a franchise roulette on the West, on the West Los Coast. Los Angeles cannot support a team because it's just, nobody, nobody cares. Got to. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, we'll gone. see how that works out. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, it's good. That should be our crazy martini, but it isn't. Uh, today, the crazy martini is coming off of the heels of the healthcare debacle. Uh, here we go with uh, the White House, and uh, they're, they're going to try and roll with two things. They're going to try and roll two wheelbarrows down Pennsylvania Avenue at the same time. How's that going to go? Yeah. I, look, there's the, the, the Trump administration came in with a lot of big items on their agenda in the first year. Health care, infrastructure, and tax reform were generally one, two, and three. Uh, we saw health care uh, crash on the rocks last week. Uh, people are saying it's back to the drawing board. Everyone's in emphasizing, look, we're not really going to, we're not dropping the issue. We just have to, it's going to be a while before we can come up with a, a new legislation that we think will get a majority of votes. So now, uh, according to Jonathan Swan over at Axios, the plan is to try to do tax reform and infrastructure at the same time. Now, people have pointed out that, you know, the, the, a lot of the same dynamics of, of a lack of a unified Republican House conference the difficulty of getting 60 votes in the Senate, mm. um, all of the dynamics that were in place for health care are going to be in place for both of these issues. Uh, tax, you know, Obama wanted to reform taxes. Trump, uh, uh, George W. Bush wanted to enact tax cuts beyond the 10-year limit, uh, and he couldn't. Um, the, the tax reform sounds easy, but it very rarely is. Then you want to do infrastructure spending which some Democrats may like, but then again, Democrats haven't been in the mood to give Trump anything lately. And obviously, if you're, unless you're a red state Democrat, the, the right. appearance of cooperating with Trump is going to have your progressive uh, uh, grassroots setting their hair on fire. 
Um, so now you've got the, you know, those particular problems, and now you're going to try to do both simultaneously, which, oh, by the way, both of them involve lots of money going out and not much money going in. Um, now, I know, that, I know that caring about deficits and debt aren't cool anymore. <laughs> that right. peaked at about 2009, 2010. But uh, I, I look at this, this gambit to try to pass both of these uh, p- major pieces of legislation concurrently. Um, I'm reminded of, uh, was it dodgeball or the line, you know, that's a bold yeah. move, Cotton. Let's see if it works out for him. Because uh, <laughs> it seems like after, you know, after tripping and over your own shoelaces late last week, uh, this seems like a formula to have uh, two big bills. Um, it's, it's, it's not hard to imagine both bills running aground in the next couple of months. The administration, Republican cron- Congress, really looking like uh, they can't get stuff done. Is the, the GOP any closer on tax reform than they were on health care, or is it just as bad? It's pretty bad because, remember, the original idea that was – first of all, uh, passing health care reform was going to gener- generate a whole bunch of savings that you could then apply to the tax cuts you wanted to uh, – yeah. An act. So, so one, phase now one, something phase don't have two, that. Yeah. The second thing was they wanted this idea of the border adjustment tax, which is basically a tax on imports. Um, some Republicans like it. Some Republicans hate it. I'm very much in the skeptical camp. And if you doubt me, take a look at the clothing labels of your, what you're wearing right now and ask yourself right. if you want to pay 20 percent more uh, than what you paid for them. Um, the idea of, you know, we finally get a Republican president, a Republican House, a Republican Senate. And we're going to suddenly raise taxes on, on imported goods. Um, is not uh, it's not what yeah. I was envisioning, but some Republicans might have less objection to that. But even then, you know, if you you're, you're basically have to figure out a way to pay for all this, um, and you know, I'm sure you'll see lots of rosy, optimistic scenarios about economic projections coming. At the same time, we're also going to have infrastructure spending. And remember, we we didn't like the stimulus. We we Republicans thought that was a terrible idea. But now, I guess um, I guess it's cool now. Now, obviously, there are some valuable. You know. Can you do infrastructure correctly? Yes. But, you know, Obama learned the hard way that the shovel-ready jobs weren't that shovel-ready. Right. And it's not unthinkable. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll be hard-pressed to see if this turns out to be dramatically different than the last stimulus that got passed. What kind of a break do we get in between the health care, uh, the end of that thing, and the start of the next ones? Are they, are they starting to write bills today? Yeah. No, I mean, they, they, they theoretically have been working on this beforehand. Um, the idea is to get this done before summer. We will see that that too seems like an ambitious one because you have to you have to have your you know your basic text of the bill, then you go through markup in both the committees, then you get through the, the full uh, amendments on the House floor. You know the standard legislative process. We all saw the you know Schoolhouse Rock episode. Um, at each one of those, there's always <laughs> the possibility that you add something that makes more people lose. Uh, you, you lose more votes than you gain, which was seemed like what was happening in, in healthcare reform. So, good luck, everybody. Buckle your seatbelts, everyone. It's going to be a fun ride here for the next couple of months. Uh, can't wait till they actually go home for the summer. Give us a little bit of a break from all of this. So there are your three martinis, good, bad, and crazy. Uh, all of them a little bit ugly. Uh, and then uh, join us again tomorrow for your Wednesday martinis. Greg Columbus back with you with Jim Garrity from the National Review Online. Until then, I am Rich McFadden saying thank you and have a great Tuesday.